Did you know that according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, two-thirds of all our fruits and veggies eaten in the United States come from outside the country? And there are all kinds of problems with that. For one, an apple that had to travel hundreds or even thousands of miles to get to your plate can't be all that fresh or nutritious. And I say that's just crazy, especially when we can grow so many different varieties in our own front and backyards. Jumping into growing your own food is actually quite simple. You just need to know the rules. My free webinar, Introduction to Urban Farming, begins to frame out your pathway to growing your own healthy food. In this free webinar, you'll learn the three simple steps to becoming an urban farmer, the five components of healthy soil, and how to think regeneratively, which is, by the way, one of the most important concepts we need to be exploring right now. Will you join me in this webinar and help co-create the food revolution? Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to urbanfarmu.org to sign up for your free webinar. That's GARDEN to 44222 or urbanfarmu.org. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food Revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Larry Santoyo of Earthflow Designs to share his bounty of permaculture knowledge. Larry has been a teacher and practitioner of permaculture design for the last 28 years. After a career in law enforcement, he went into land use planning and was mentored by Permaculture's founding father, Bill Mollison. Larry went on to teach Permaculture with Mollison around the U.S. and Australia. He has taught environmental design at colleges and universities nationwide. He is also the senior designer at Earthflow Designs in Los Angeles, one of the largest permaculture companies in the world. The firm specializes in planning and design that integrates economic development strategies with ecological systems management in residential, commercial, and municipal projects. Larry is vice president of the Permaculture Institute and a recipient of permaculture diplomas in the fields of education, community development, site design, community service, and research. Welcome to the show today, Larry. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so glad you're here. You're actually one of my longtime teachers. So I have a a special interest in today's conversation. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Oh, my favorite subject. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I often tell a story about how how I got involved. It was kind of circuitous, um, but... Those are the, the best final, kind. Yeah. <laughs> in the final analysis, it really is the same path. You know, I, I was, I worked for the state of California. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually injured on duty. I, I, I was a park ranger, among other things, worked out in the woods, uh, was a backcountry ranger, and I was a law enforcement ranger for a number of years. Mm. Uh, worked in law enforcement. Um I like to think of those days as uh, bringing peace and security to a world hungry for both, although wasn't very appreciative. Mm. Kind of a thankless job being Mm -hmm. in law enforcement. You know, people people love you when they need you, but really, you know, (laughs) that's rare. That's rare. I was I was actually injured on duty and working for the state. uh, Probably the best thing I ever did. The the best bad decision I ever did uh, was get injured. Working for the state of California, I was trained in land use planning, uh-huh. uh, retrained, I should say, uh, you know, vocational rehab. Part of it was that I had to specialize in something, and I really loved the whole uh, natural resource path that I was on mm-hmm. before in terms of, you know, restoration of landscapes, uh, streams, uh, dry lands, uh, forest, a lot of different uh, t- terrains and topography Mm -hmm. so i wanted to specialize in that and i had heard about a very little known thing at the time in the in the early 80s and mid 80s was permaculture design so i put in training requests for permaculture design courses and at that time bill mollison was the only person teaching so 
they approved, you know, all of the training uh, requests that I gave them, which, uh, much to my surprise, uh -huh. and much to their surprise when I finished uh, getting trained in land use planning with a emphasis on resource management, uh, a la permaculture design, I uh, quickly uh, left the state and started my own uh, company in, in the late 80s, mm -hmm. uh, 1989. By the early 90s, we were the first planning, land use planning group in the American Planners Association um, wow. uh, with the, you know, ecological twist to it. Right. You know, we, we only did ecological design at that time. So that company you started was in Tucson? It was. We started a, a, a company, a group of talented designers, permaculture people that I had known through the years. Mm -hmm. um, we decided that we would work out of a, an office in Tucson. Uh, we thought that working in the dry lands was kind of, you know, the toughest road to hoe. Oh, so yeah. we would, you know, kind of the old, if we can make it here, we can make it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it proved to be difficult. Uh, you know, I think that like a lot of those things, a lot of those ideas all around the sustainability campfire, although we didn't have that term for it yet. Yeah was a little ahead of its time. And I, I don't mean that arrogantly, that comes later. <laughs> um, but, the, you know, I think that just the masses, you know, people just weren't quite ready for it. And investing in something that we knew they needed, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that they really knew that they needed it. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of the permaculture curriculum was really developed because of that fact. You know, in the early days working with Bill Mollison, and I traveled quite a bit with him and was fortunate enough to be on site uh, with different con consulting jobs that he did uh -huh. that I, le I was able to learn a lot. And I saw that people weren't quite ready for it and we really needed to focus on the educational aspects mm -hmm. of it. And I think that that's uh, a lot of our businesses er early on, a lot of the people that were on the ground and in the trenches in those days had sort of a two two front fight that they were that they were fighting one was you know the development end of it um, design and build end of things and also the education and yeah. uh, getting you know sort of branding and marketing of, of sustainability mm -hmm. and you know we didn't have words like that yet right Sec sexy words like sustainability <laughs> sustainability yeah. yeah and regenerative yeah. design regenerative and yeah. you know um, now I heard a good one that is, um, you know, responsible innovation. And we started oh, yeah. talking about innovation generation um, a few years back. Mm -hmm. and I always liked that one. So what is your definition of permaculture? I think I have the uh, premier best definition <laughs> of permaculture. Uh, it's funny because I, 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 I uh, also people have heard me tell a story that I I avoid that question mm. at all costs. You know, what is permaculture? Mm. And I always tell my students that if, if somebody asks you that, then you've done something horribly wrong. <laughs> you know, because it, 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 it not only is it difficult and impossible to define it in, in some sense, uh -huh. um, it takes away from the conversation of what you actually want to describe. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I often say, just talk about the, you know, the orphanage that you're building. Just talk about the gardens that you're designing for the community. Just talk about the homes that you're designing or, you know, leave out permaculture because it'll detract from that, mm -hmm. you know. And then... I, I realized after a couple of decades of being in the business that permaculture really is about decision making. It really is about uh, problem solving and decision making. Mm -hmm. And that is my definition of permaculture. I think that it, 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 permaculture design is protocols uh, for decision making and problem solving based on natural patterns, period. And I think that with that, you can approach everything. You know, you, 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 one of the things that I correct a lot of people on, including uh -huh. myself over and over, that, you know, you don't do permaculture. You use permaculture mm -hmm. in what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think that it gives it a whole other light. You know, I've been in a lot of different conversations and almost, you know, fist fights over the whole, <laughs> you know, uh, what is permaculture? What, it, what you know? permaculture doesn't work 
you know, I've heard that before. It's like, how does, <laughs> how does systems thinking yeah. not work? How yeah. does mimicking nature not work? You know, it's maybe your understanding or a, a lot of that responsibility does rest on us as teachers of what gets taught. Uh-huh. You know, I used to, I, I thought it, that I came to a big uh, realization that, you know, a, and uh, that I would be responsible for what I say, finally, right? You know, I would, I would finally be responsible for what I say, but I think that it's as important to be responsible for what people hear oh, as yes. well uh-huh. you know and that you know communication you know depends a lot on the listener but mm-hmm. it also depends on you know you can't just leave things you know where they lie sometimes yeah. that's a that, hu- that's you know, huge we, well yeah i i think that it is because we have done ourselves a disservice in allowing people to believe and especially teachers to believe that permaculture design is about designing gardens Mm -hmm. and it is it is i am here to tell you it is not about gardening Mm -hmm. you know it is not about designing garden it is design the garden is the beautiful metaphor for us to use in teaching permaculture yeah but it is a metaphor for everything you know, all things can be designed, mm-hmm. and it's it's a beautiful illustration in the garden, and it's the sexiest thing, and you know, on and on. I I, I think that there's there's a lot that we can, and we've got some kick-ass garden designs. You know, oh, I yeah. said, you know, it's like it's hard to it's hard not to it's hard not to uh, use it as examples, uh-huh. but it's only an example, and I. I I hesitate to use that word example. It's more of a metaphor. Yeah. You know, things things grow from the garden and we can sort of design anything, anything like that. So what is one of your more favorite permaculture concepts? I think that the concepts of permaculture in that, you know, I quickly realized that you know, at first, I really wanted uh, to define permaculture and describe permaculture as a, a set of techniques and technologies. I thought that that was pretty concise and pretty, mm-hmm. uh, you know, pretty descriptive, you know, because there's a lot of things that we could do, you know, out in the world and in in natural systems, like to help help with erosion, help with, you know, water conservation, energy conservation, mm-hmm. all these techniques and technologies that we learn about. But it really isn't about techniques and technologies. I think that the best concept, the biggest concept to grasp and to teach is what a lot of people you know, try to avoid. And that is the theory behind permaculture design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that it is the most, the probably the most important part of permaculture training is in fact the the theory behind it. Yeah. I know a lot of people talk about how, oh, I am a I am a tactile learner. I learn by doing, I learn by but you know, we can teach you a course on how to build with straw bales, but it's permaculture design that directs you and allows you to arrive at when and where to use straw bale bale. methodologies and technologies you know you use it when you need you know super insulation and you know on and on you arrive at solutions you don't impose solutions no matter how eco hip they are yeah you know i think that that's really important that that it's the theory behind it that is that sets it apart really Mm -hmm. It, it, it helps you make decisions on you know anybody can learn how to build with you know, stone, how to build with straw bales, how to build with, but it's really a a serious permaculture designer that can step back and really just use though the, as part of the toolbox, you know, that, you know, what I've got in my, in my arsenal of, of, uh, of things to use Mm -hmm. once I've made a decision after reading, you know, the patterns of the landscape. Yeah. I believe that nature directs the land use plan you know you just have to be you have to be alert enough you have to be aware enough yeah. those alert enough among us uh, are reading the landscape mm-hmm. and then allowing nature to direct us yeah beautiful so you've been doing this a very long time 
and you had you worked I've with been, I've been correction I've been using this using it okay very good <laughs> <laughs> don't do permaculture don't, use right. permaculture you've been you've been looking at and and using permaculture for a very long time so much so that the really the the guy that penned it that's what I say about Bill Mollison uh, you know he put it together in in a usable book form you actually worked with him uh, yeah, I, d I did. And, uh, you know, I consider him one of the most uh, influential people, whether he knows it or whether the world knows it or not. not I, yeah. I, I have a continued great deal of respect for him. Uh, we used to be very good friends at, at one time. Uh -huh. and, and I think that uh, the genius of Bill Mollison's um, tome, you know, the book mm -hmm. that he wrote, uh, A Designer's Manual, you know, I think it speaks for itself. You know, here it is decades later, and it still has complete, in, you know, oh, yeah. really, you know, exciting information mm -hmm. as a point of departure, you know, in terms of what to be looking for and how to how to arrive at, at decision making. Yeah. You know, I, I think that it's that it's amazing. Can you tell me a little bit about the how permaculture has developed over the past three or four decades? And because you've had, you know, you've had a firsthand view of that. How has how has permaculture come into its own over the past? I I think that you know um, uh, permaculture. I think that it's come on strong and it has accelerated. And then I, you know, the, a, a lot of times people when I get interviewed, it's like, well, what do you think? You know. Why do you think permaculture hasn't reached the mainstream, you know, mm -hmm. yet or something? And to me, I don't really see it that way. I don't see it as an objective, really, right. even, you know, that permaculture become mainstream because I think that that's when things get, you know, that's really when things go bad, you know, is when mm -hmm. things are mainstream, mm -hmm. you know. Not that I don't want Kim Kardashian to, you know, use permaculture in, you know, everything that they build. You know, it just, I don't want it to be a fad that fades away. Yeah. You know, this is important work. And I, and I, it, you know, I think that it deserves, a, you know, a, a better place than me, than mainstream. <laughs> I, I do think that people fail to recognize how it is adopted and how it really has accelerated in is its acceptance maybe mm -hmm. not just the terminology but certainly the methodology certainly the outlook of whole systems design and and systems thinking has really started to breach almost all disciplines that i'm involved with now you know i think that early on or in the early years i think the best thing that happened was Bill Mollison taking the punches for us in academia. Oh, yeah. I think that really went through a rigorous sort of peer review, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. I think that people were really looking to kick, kick him out of, you know, all, <laughs> all invitations to speak and whatnot. And so there was a rigorous uh, kind of uh, a lens that it went through early on. And then I think that... Whether good or bad, I think that you know the ready audience in the world in those days in the in the late sixties, seventies, and early eighties was you know the back to the landers, uh, right. uh, you know on on just about every continent, you mm -hmm. know sort of the the hippie groups that were you know trying their hand at at building and and living together and having a conversation about it. So I think that it, it was kind of reached its popularity and a lot of its roots were from that kind of uh, movement of, you know, again, we didn't have those, we didn't have that terminology bundled, you know, there was, right. there was a, dozens of different camps and that was really the beauty of Bill Mollison uh, bringing permaculture design in my eyes mm -hmm. because I went to s several conferences where we talked about, you know, agriculture and natural agriculture and, and uh, Fukuoka-san and his mm -hmm. approach and, you know, all these different things. Uh, and then, oh, energy. Oh, there's solar energy. Oh, yeah. there's this. Oh, there's that. And then when Bill talked about, you know, the future, he kind of put it all together for us or allowed a place for us to put all these different pieces of information. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of it like a skeleton, 
you know, where now we can take all these things that we know of and heard of and put it somewhere and look at it and see its relationship and its importance to other techniques, technologies and disciplines of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think that that same framework works today. I think, I mean, I really do. I think that it's, it's the same kind of methodology where you can get new information and put it where it goes. Yeah. You know, that's why I, I really believe that permaculture designers, you know, uh, look for critique in their work because they truly want to b improve it. Oh, that's, you know, yeah. how do I update my work? How, uh -huh. do I, how do I learn new things? Look at my stuff and tell me what I'm missing or, you know, tell me what's the latest instead of this piece. Mm -hmm. I love that about it, actually. Yeah. yeah. So how would you suggest someone new to permaculture? So somebody, somebody steps into our podcast and they're listening to what you have to say and they're really fascinated. It's like, what's the pathway in? How do we, how does somebody new to this, you know, dive in and start experiencing permaculture? Well, when you, when you say somebody new to it, I, I, I still, I still think that everybody has a, a pathway. Everybody has a trail to where they're standing now. Uh -huh. You know, that if you, if you th think about what got you to even that realization that you're interested in it, uh -huh. what the permaculture design course does uh, over and over and over on every continent for decades is that it introduces people to uh, I think a point of departure for the rest of their lives. Mm. I think that in inevitably yeah. people really find something that they are passionate about and then spend the next period of their <laughs> life pursuing that passion. Yeah. But with the, with the knowledge and with the understanding that they're supported by the other disciplines, they're supported by the other elements in the system, the mm -hmm. other items on, on the interest list. You know, other people get passionate about architecture and you may have a passion for food growing and, you know, food support or, you know, some kind of combination of those things. You know, greenhouses or, you know, there's a, a lot of different things, the, the heating technologies, the cooking technology. The, yeah. the cooling, natural cooling, you know, there's a lot of different things to become passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, people new to permaculture design need to take permaculture courses over and over again. <laughs> I think that it's really designed that way. It's yeah. impossible. It's impossible to absorb all the information. You know, you have to take it over and over. Yeah. I, I started, you know, the, the, our conversation by saying that, you know, I took uh, at least five design courses before mm -hmm. I, you know, really thought about that I could design or that I wanted to teach. Yeah. Um, uh, the, you know, the other part of that, once you find that passion, is to just sort of get experience in it. You know, I, and I think that wanting other people to know about permaculture or teaching permaculture, I think that uh, I would I would put a word of caution for people uh, if they're if they're in that route. I think that really the sophisticated audiences of today demand uh -huh. kind of a more of an experiential dissertation mm -hmm. i think that people really need to be able to answer questions i think that wanting to become a an instructor of permaculture design or permaculture design disciplines really comes from experience yeah and i think that there's a lot to do along that path don't get me wrong there's mm -hmm. hundreds of workshops there's hundreds of you know day long things but in terms of you know teaching certificate courses I think that it really demands a, a pretty, you know, a, a breadth of experience that comes with that, you know, like right. letting go of what you're doing now and dedicating, yeah. you know, I think that when you have a, a, a surplus, a, an overwhelming, you know, uh, uh, abundance of, of information that you just have to download some of it, that's when you become uh, a permaculture design Designer. course yeah. instructor. Now, you mentioned permaculture design course, or as we call it, a PDC. Can you just say a little bit about what that is? Yeah, I think that it, 
the permaculture design courses were, you know, really a, a, a display of all of the different aspects that you could use permaculture principles to design. Mm -hmm. I start my courses by asking people, you know, for a definition of permaculture, just to, for a laugh, I guess, because uh -huh. it just kind of goes all over the board and oh, it's yeah. very hilarious about what people think permaculture is and how they describe it. And, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a wonder why people think we're kind of knuckleheads. But ask people, you know, ask a group of people to individually describe, describe what permaculture yeah. is, and it's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But what it, what what it, I inevitably get to is that let's say that we want to create a sustainable uh, human settlement. Mm -hmm. What is it that we would need? And you know, everything. You know, food, water, shelter. You know, waste system, transportation, communication. You know, we go through the list, and I, and I just draw a big sort of circle, the wheel of of life for a human settlement, and it. And I label it all these different items and all these different topics that people have have you know yelled out uh, to to the for us to include in the in our sustainable future. Mm -hmm. And then I tell them that permaculture design is this. You know, when somebody asks you what permaculture design is, draw them this. <laughs> you know, because it really is what what you learn is that. We're just repeating the same day over yeah. and over and over again. Once you get principles of mm -hmm. design, then what we're going to do is we're going to use those principles of design for decision making and problem solving. And we're going to put that over, uh, let's pick food today. Mm -hmm. So we will solve food needs for our sustainable human settlement using these permaculture design principles and applications. Mm -hmm. And we develop protocols for those designs. And then we'll step back and say, okay shelter let's talk about shelter then we'll use the same principles of design and e use it to arrive at what the best shelters would be and how and why and on and on and on and yeah. then even communication you know i treat communication we have a module that we've developed where communication is looked at as ecology hmm. as an ecosystem yeah. with different pieces that you know play parts and roles you know, and then, of course, economics and oh, what we call in, in permaculture design, invisible structures yep. uh, has been part of the curriculum for, you know, from the beginning. Right. You know, and I know that a lot of people find that surprising. But, you know, economics and economic development and how we conduct commerce, how we do these things, uh, you know, again, is in a diversified approach, a polyculture mm -hmm. of commerce is really uh, you know diff you know different transactions require different modes just like you know in a regular ecosystem or building a landscape yeah so, so i think that there's a lot there's a lot to that right so you, you actually teach this stuff do you do that through earthflow designs your company we, we have like a lot of us we have sort of two fronts i have earthflow designs which is you know we do landscape architecture design and build uh and we've got uh the permaculture academy oh. which we have separated out to be you know the the educational uh, arm of what we do mm -hmm. Um, and we teach, you know, all over. We've taught, you know, a, a different continents and uh, we teach regularly up and down the coast with, a, you know, a handful of, of teachers who also have 30 years experience, you yeah. know. Um, and uh, I think that we've got, you know, we're getting better and better at it. I think <laughs> we've got pretty good reviews over the years. Yeah. And uh, we are, you know, I've been teaching almost, you know, 28, 29 years. Wow. Uh -huh. The last 16 of those uh, 29 years, uh, we've been in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, where I think that, you know, we've got probably the biggest urban permaculture force anywhere. Yeah. Oh, how cool is that? And I've really seen it evolve. I've, I did my first permaculture design course in 91, and I've seen it evolve. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been, that evolution has been nice. I think that it's uh, uh, maybe becoming more... Uh, understandable as we've understood it more uh, I think that that's the key I think that at first we didn't we, we didn't have the experience at articulating how yeah. it could be used mm -hmm. you know I think that it's like you know like the internet when it first came out you mm -hmm. know 
a lot of us that had it first off is like, oh, this is great. You're like, hi, <laughs> how's it going? Yeah. You know, we didn't realize that we could tra be transmitting, you know, the information that we transmit now. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's the same with permaculture design that, you know, that it, it really is. I, I believe that the its biggest, most powerful, you know, one of the leverage points that we may talk about in permaculture in using leverage points is in urban planning, mm -hmm. is in, you know, uh, land use planning, architecture design, landscape architecture, those kinds of things. Because, you know, they're already designing public spaces. They're already designing economic systems. Yeah. And, you know, I think that there's a big, a big part of what goes on now. People are, I, I, you know, I, I want to say finally catching up to, you know, what permaculture has been teaching for 30 years, but that might be a little arrogant, mm, it, but it, I it, really it, do think that that's what's happening. Yeah. It feels comfortable though. You know, like yeah, I said, it's been, yeah. it's been 25 years for me and, yeah. and I've seen that evolution and, and it is, I, what I see now is people getting it faster than I did. Yeah. Oh, it's funny that you say that because I, I do, I think that that, it, the the audiences definitely have become more sophisticated, yeah. and I think that that is a uh, you know uh, uh, attributed to you know our accelerated information pace. Mm -hmm. And I know that you you know that you guys have been doing like online training, and yeah. you know in the early years it was like how could you do this online? But yeah. you know people do learn online, mm -hmm. and I've kind of come around to that. You know a lot of this could be taught. You know, by by hearing it, listening to it, but I I also you know I I have to believe that a lot of it is experiential, and yeah. you know I, I'm a firm believer in you know real time yep. uh, transfer of knowledge. Yeah, that's one of the you I've know, said face this, face to face. Yeah. you know, real time transfer of knowledge. Yeah. I've said this for a while. I given the experiential nature of a permaculture design course, I don't know how they do them online. Um, but so many of the techniques can be taught online. Yeah, and a lot of the conversation parts, you know, which is a big part of what, how I learned about, you know, permaculture design. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned from a great orator, uh, Bill Mollison, mm -hmm. and uh, my particular style it, you know, is as a storyteller. Yeah. I, I'm well aware of different learning styles, you know, that exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on what book you read, there's three learning styles, seven learning styles, <laughs> five <laughs> learning styles, you know, it's, yeah. but I, I also know that it is time tested, mother approved mm -hmm. approach to transfer of knowledge is storytelling. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm a storyteller. And I think that it affects as, as many of the, or, or actually, it, it it all learning styles learn from storytelling. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely get that. So I'm going to shift a little bit on you now, and I'm going to ask you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. Uh, I think that there's a lot of a lot of that involved. I think that, you know, not fully understanding the, you know, all what, what sectors really mean. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk about sectors, you know, as outside influencing energies, things that will affect our design. You know, it's kind of it's kind of a basic protocol. But I think that what hit me hard, you know, on, on a personal level was uh, you know, some of the sectors that I didn't think of as sectors, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in terms of relationships, in terms of, you know, uh, like s city officials, um, you know, a, a lot of different layers of things to, to conducting business uh -huh. that I really w didn't want to be aware of. But, yeah. you know, through the years, I think that it hit us hard. Mm -hmm. um, and but we learned the most. And I think that, uh, you know, that I have a great deal to offer in terms of that, uh, it, it, in terms of, you know, looking, trying to look and overcome different th things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at planning department, you know, 
uh, kind of approach as natural succession modeling. Setting the stage for yes to happen is a big part of, you know, one of our modules, uh-huh. you know, that we, you know, we're working with different planning departments and instead of getting devastated and losing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a project that we, you know, plan for the possible, you know, the possibilities that exist and not getting approval or, you know, these kinds of things. Yeah. I think that that there's a lot to that kind of using, you know, that 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 came about a long and hard lesson too. Was just you know that uh, I needed to use permaculture design on my own businesses and my own approach to life and my domestic situation yeah. and on and on. That was that there. There's another one, you know, where I, I neglected to include myself and you know use permaculture design to design my own economic strategies mm-hmm. and relationship strategies and domestic environment strategies and i you know i suffered greatly for it um and i think that it, it's important to you know to look at that and you know try not to repeat it so much yeah. you know? you've mentioned the term sectors several times can you give us a, uh-huh. a definition of that for the listeners yeah, that don't know uh, sectors are are uh, an approach to design that is pretty uh, you know uh, it's it's widely accepted it's mm-hmm. not really called sectors in other disciplines but most other design disciplines have um th- you know you could think of it as data overlays is one of the ways that we oh, teach yeah. it where you've got Perfect. a map and then okay it's a map of this site right but it doesn't really tell us anything until we can think about the sectors right so now we put an overlay over that map and it gives us the to Topography. So oh, now yeah. we know where, you know, the steep slopes are and the flat areas are, and mm-hmm. you know, that's just sort of information gathering. Uh, I, I recently w- was involved in in a, a design charrette uh, with the uh, city of Los Angeles in. Um, the Los Angeles River is getting, you know, possibly billion of dollar uh, re mm-hmm. re um, revamp, and there's a lot of information going around about it, and there's a lot of ideas, of course, but. I was happy and pleased to find out how much, uh, you know, stepping back and uh, just gathering information, data gathering. I thought the sector planning that the groups have done Mm -hmm. has been incredible. You know, looking at different demographics as a sector, looking at different, you know, not just soil types and, you know, access and, you know, hydrological information, but demographics and, Mm -hmm. you know, it turns out that, and I didn't realize it, it turns out that 25% of the population of California lives within 30 miles of the Los Angeles River. Wow. And, and uh, the other interesting thing was they said within an hour of the Los Angeles River, and that's 30 miles. So hmm. it gives you a little insight to the traffic issues. It, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna we say. did get a new train. We did mm-hmm. get a new train. Yeah, it was perfect. sort of east and East and West, that was a problem yeah. in Los Angeles. North and South is okay, but so, yeah. getting East and West has always been an issue. So what do you consider your biggest success? Uh, my biggest success, uh, I would have to say, is coming around and re-evaluating my own self mm-hmm. and my own approach to my business, again, my domestic life, uh, my family, uh, all the things that I thought, you know, was was obvious that I was trying to take care of, but wasn't, you know, and I think that finally coming to terms with that and finally making it explicit that there's mm-hmm. a big and important part of my life, yeah. you know, that uh, and I and I counsel people a lot about how you, you've got to you can't forget about zone zero and zone so, one, you yeah. know. Feather the nest, for God's sakes, before you spend your last, you know, $100,000 on, you know, foolishness, like yeah. saving the world and <laughs> permaculture and stuff, you know, make sure that your domestic life is taken care of yeah. and people are happy at home. Well said. So what drives you? I think a big part of it these days is that, you know, that, you know, it finally 
feels like there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, it finally feels like people are getting aware of some of the issues that we're talking about mm -hmm. and running with it. You know, the, you know, I learn stuff all day long. You know, I, I talk about how I, I teach around the world, but I really learn around the world, too. Oh, yeah. and, and I learn a great deal about, you know, why people are doing things. And to me, that's that's a big part of, uh, you know, that it's not just about uh, how much we can preserve and conserve and, you know, how much information we can cultivate. It's it's really we have to remember why we're doing it. And and I think that, you know, a lot of us come to that, you know, familiar place of family and mm -hmm friends and you know i have six-year-old granddaughters now mm, so i think that nice. that has a lot to do with, oh, with yeah. how i have you know maybe mellowed out i'm not sure yeah but i think that that's the kind of things that people are looking at and yeah. maybe it's always been that way and it's it's kind of a refreshing thing for me to incorporate into my work and my mm -hmm. you know even my teaching mm -hmm. you know that it's, you know, it's not that they give a shit about us. It's that we care about them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't mean, mean just family. It's like the world, people on the planet, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have to care about what we're doing. And that's, that's a new thing for me. Mm -hmm. We do it anyway. <laughs> Love that. So I'm all about education and I have to know, is there one book that has been influential for you in this process? Well, I think that there's a lot of books uh, lately that I've been reading on, you know, just mindful meditation and, mm -hmm. you know, insightful things like that. Um, Autobiography of a Yogi, you know, an old book that's been on my shelves for, you know, decades and decades, but I've finally cracked it open. Uh, but I think that in terms of systems thinking, which I believe that permaculture is, you know, rooted in is the books that Odom wrote. Um, th there's a lot of books on uh, physics and theory of design and on e ecological systems. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Odom, I think, is the, is the, you know, was the doorway for me. I think I, I overheard Bill Mollison talking about him and years later looked it up. And there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of, tomes and a lot of you know heavy stuff that was written by uh odom but i think that there's uh th that that would have to be this what i would say in terms of the most important books mm -hmm. influential books uh and, uh along those lines i always try to ask people that i respect you know what what they think not are the great books but like the what are the great unwritten books oh yeah you know, to to them, to me, to me, that would that means something like people that I respect. They think that there's a there's a hole out there or they think that it could be fill a void, you know. And I think there's a there's a lot of good ones that I've heard. Yeah. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Oh, that would have to be, you know, get some experience, you know just like really bite the bullet quit your job stop mm -hmm. eating you know stop you know stop <laughs> for crap you know get out and do something yeah you know that that's the thing that that's the single biggest contribution you could make is bring something to the table mm -hmm. you know whoever said you don't have to bring anything to the table <laughs> didn't get it they, yeah. they 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 i don't think they did it out of malice but it's not accurate you know it's like why would you do that to us you know, come to the table with nothing to offer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I really want you to be welcome everywhere. And that is like by gaining experience at something, you know, yeah. uh, you know, learn how to cuss in several languages, and <laughs> scrape your knuckles and lose a digit and lose an eye and lose an eye from a flying digit. And, you know, <laughs> learn to just like get out there and, you know, hurt your back. I think that people will, you know, people will will help people who are working hard. And that's a skill set that we all need to cultivate. You know, I, I think that it, it's 
really the more you work and the more you learn about how much you can take and how much you can do is really when you begin to wonder and have excitement and appreciation for just that being able to wonder about things yeah you know how could it be what could we do where can we go from here Mm -hmm. you know i think that you know a lot of us grow up thinking you know that we have to be afraid of the world and we have to be afraid of the future and i i just you know i want people to calm down i don't (laughs) think we need to be afraid anymore Uh we don't don't have to be afraid of the future Mm -hmm. you know that uh you know i i I want people to embrace the future but not out of fear you know not out of fear Mm -hmm. you know embrace sustainability not out of fear embrace sustainability because we love the things we love about right now Mm -hmm. beautiful well said thank you then thank you for joining us on the show today and sharing your experience with us today larry Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? I'm not a hard man to track. (laughs) Uh, You can find us at permacultureacademy.com and at earthflow.com. Perfect. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Thank you. Did you know that according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Two-thirds of all our fruits and veggies eaten in the United States come from outside the country. And there are all kinds of problems with that. For one, an apple that had to travel hundreds or even thousands of miles to get to your plate can't be all that fresh or nutritious. And I say that's just crazy, especially when we can grow so many different varieties in our own front and backyards. Jumping into growing your own food is actually quite simple. You just need to know the rules. My free webinar, Introduction to Urban Farming, begins to frame out your pathway to growing your own healthy food. In this free webinar, you'll learn the three simple steps to becoming an urban farmer, the five components of healthy soil, and how to think regeneratively, which is, by the way, one of the most important concepts we need to be exploring right now. Will you join me in this webinar and help co-create the food revolution? Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to urbanfarmu.org to sign up for your free webinar. That's GARDEN to 44222 or urbanfarmu.org. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.